Welcome to Paranormal Palace Radio, where truth equals reality, and truth is often stranger than fiction. Hello everyone, welcome to Paranormal Palace Radio. This is your host, Royce the Redneck Radio Man, and joining me today is going to be uh, Richard Hooper, and I thought me and him might start out today talking about the real secrets of Christianity, but after talking to him for a little while, uh, I think we'll lead this in there a little bit further down the road about um, some of the parallel sayings between Jesus and Buddha, and I want to say it was Christian, if I remember correctly. I don't have that in front of me, and I'll be more than happy to have uh, Richard correct me if I'm getting that part wrong. But, uh, you know, the two seem to work well together, so I thought it'd be a good idea to, you know, get to both of them. So, Richard, before we get started too far, I want to first off thank you for coming on my show. It's a pleasure to have you here, uh, especially since how you've been a radio host, uh, you know, yourself in the past, and it's kind of like, uh, you know, dealing with one of your own kind, you might say, sort of. Also, I wanted to get, give you a chance to... Uh, Tell everybody in the audience a little something about yourself and, you know, what got you involved in, uh, you know, the kind of uh, field you're in now. Because, I mean, I read up on your bio and originally you were a Lutheran pastor that uh, branched away from that. And I'm sure you had your own reasons. But I thought you could tell us a little something about it. Yes, well, thank you. Um, uh, What moved me away from that was actually going to seminary in the first place. But. Backing up a little bit, when I was in college, I took uh, courses in Eastern philosophy, thinking that you know if I was going to be a, a Christian minister, that I ought to know something about other religions. Turned out that I was about the only person in the seminary that ever uh, had that idea. <laughs> but in any case, <laughs> I was really fascinated with Eastern philosophy, Vedanta in particular. And so that was hanging in there by the time I started seminary after college. And seminary uh, education basically, you know, killed my Christian belief system because basically the professors would say, you know, all this stuff in the Gospels that you believe is history, um, it's not. It's mythology, and we don't know that much about the historical Jesus, et cetera, et cetera. So by the middle of seminary, I was already a heretic because while I still was um, very much oriented towards the teachings of Jesus, um, I wasn't interested anymore in, in the mythical Christ figure. So uh, when I did begin my ministry, it was the ministry of the counterculture. So I was kind of the hippie priest of the Monterey Peninsula for about seven, eight years, um, you know, and very much looked the part. And the, the church would just go, oh, I guess he has to look like that to relate to those people, <laughs> which was always fun. They you know, could show up at conventions looking to like a hippie, and, and sort of had to put up with me. <laughs> <laughs> I bet they didn't exactly so, love that one. <laughs> but I think, you know, I couldn't really have gone into a regular parish at that point in time because my, my philosophy, you know, spiritual philosophy, was just too far away from where the church was. Well, I'll be honest with you. I was involved in the church myself once. My dad was a Pentecostal pastor, and... For a while there, I'd call it a Sunday school, but like you, I kind of drifted away from it, and uh, I've been more involved with Eastern philosophy here recently than uh, the actual church myself. I mean, I've done a great deal of study, learned quite a bit about the early church and its origins, and but it just seemed to me to make more sense to uh, distance myself from organized religion and kind of do the way Jesus said and seek the kingdom of heaven inside yourself. Uh, According to him, it was in you and around you all the time anyway. And I want to thank you in the Bible, it was either John or James who said, you'd have no need of man to guide you, the Holy Spirit would guide you, which would come from the looking inside, in other words. So I thought it might be better since some things were kind of up in the air, like you were saying from what you were learning in seminary, to go that route. I was wondering if you uh, maybe found that to be a similar uh, case in your deal. Uh, yes, and it was clear back in college when I started noticing similarities between the teachings of Jesus and the teachings in Eastern philosophy. And so, you know, I've spent a couple books worth of time um, comparing uh, 
his teachings with with uh, what we have from Hinduism, Buddhism, and Taoism. And so my I have two books there that spread those concepts across the page, so you can look and see the parallels. And it just shows people clearly that I believe that Jesus was saying essentially the same thing as you know a teacher in, in the data would say. He just put it in a context of his time period and his culture. But if you can imagine what it's like to be the Buddha who wakes up in the India and everybody looks at him and sees transform, they say, "Oh, you, you're you're there. You reached there. Congratulations." Now, if Jesus woke up in the same way and looked around at everything in in Palestine and thinks, "Oh crap, I'm in trouble now. If I tell this, if I <laughs> talk to people about what I know, um, they're going to stone me. They're going to this or that because there was no culture that would allow for." Uh, mystical awareness. So anything that was outside of traditional religion, um, the the person would be in trouble. But um, you know, I, I believe that the historical Jesus, you know, had to couch everything he said in terms that uh, Jewish culture would understand, and they only understand for just so much, and and otherwise, um, you know, it got lost. And you know, there was an early um, gathering of his disciples, although we don't really know uh, any, we don't really know who they were at the time that he was traveling around the country, but you know, we do know that by 50 CE that, um, that Peter and John and James, Jesus' brother, were in Jerusalem, and they had a problem with uh, this, this character called Paul, who was, you know, had no credentials and followed no, none of their tradition, and, and he's off with some tangent, and so they get into a big tiff at one point. And this early Christianity goes in different directions. So um, all those things are kind of wrapped up into one, but you know, I'm still working on the, the whole concept um, of um, you know trying to get it across to people, particularly scholars, that, that Jesus was a mystic, and that he taught essentially the same mystical truths as uh, Krishna and Buddha Lao Tzu. And so it's, you know, it's up to me to, to prove that, actually. Um, and my next book is, is going to be geared directly uh, to that issue, because I think it's important as much as I've learned from scholars and doing the scholarship for years and years and years that, you know, that work is real important, but scholars generally only see it from the point of view of, of their Christian background or Western religious background, Judeo-Christianity, and they're not even able to, you know, judge uh, or analyze Jesus' teachings as they parallel the same teachings in other religions. They just don't go there. So they can't, they're having you know, trouble getting a consensus. Pardon? I said they're having trouble getting a consensus going on it. Well, no, they have their own way of, of, you know, analyzing stuff. And, you know, they're going to be judging everything uh, from the basis of what they know. And what they know is, you know, they know Judeo-Christianity history. They know Greek culture history and all of that. What they don't know is, is mystical anything. So they're trying to tell you what is and isn't the words of the historical Jesus um, and basing that on their understanding of uh, Judeo-Christian early culture and so forth, but they never look at it from the perspective of was Jesus teaching something on the order of, of mysticism, and and you know they have never been able to come up with a truly spiritual Jesus. They, you know, the early Jesus in, in in scholarship back in the 19th century was a failed uh, Messianic. Prophet, which That's interesting. And uh, later scholarship got rid of that, um, initiated a second quest of the historical Jesus that lasted up until the fifties. And their conclusion was that they couldn't know a darn thing about Jesus and kind of left it there. And then a third uh, search for quest for the historical Jesus began in the eighties. And these guys now are at a point where they're saying, "Well, Jesus was a, a cynic sage." So the cynic philosophy of, of Greece, and you know they're relating him to that. So 
they look at us, they look at it at teachings and they look at stuff that's clear to me what Jesus was saying and they're not able to see that clarity so they're trying to, you know, throw the stuff out if possible. Um, they don't understand asceticism or the reasons why somebody would separate from society, why they would, you know, give away their money to the poor and the itinerant, et cetera, et cetera. So they have to judge everything based on their limited knowledge of Western culture, not Eastern. And, uh, you know, I'd like to see them get beyond that someday. Yeah, I would kind of like to see that myself. You know, I thought it was interesting, if I understood you correctly a minute ago, and before I say this, and I, I'm going to try not to lose my thought here, I want to make sure I don't forget to mention to everybody that your website is www.sanctuarypublications.com. You can find articles by him, more information about him personally, uh, you know, as well as his books. And he's got other authors there that he publishes. He tells a little something about them. They got their little profile in there, you might call it. And their books are listed with their descriptions. And it's got a lot of knowledge over there, and I recommend people going over there and looking into it and seeing what they got. You can also get his books through Amazon. And, I mean, I've got links to his book here on my site, and I'm going to be moving that to the archive later today or tomorrow. But I was wanting to get back to what I heard you mention earlier about Christ. And um, if I understood you correctly, nobody uh, had come up with a uh, a teaching of his that was mystical, uh a much scholarship, uh, scholarship, if I understood correctly, because some of the stuff that I read that were supposedly said by Jesus in uh, some of the uh, synoptic gospels sounded like they were mystic teachings to me. Um, the scene with Peter when Jesus was saying, who do you say that I am? And he talked about blessing Peter for recognizing he was the uh, son of the living God. And on that rock building his church, I thought was a mystical teaching about the um, connection of the Holy Spirit and uh, building his church on people who were filled, filled with the Holy Spirit. And I was wondering if you had any uh, feedback on that or anything to add to that to uh, correct me, maybe if I misunderstood or, you know, uh, elaborate if I didn't misunderstand. Well, scholars, first off, their, their first mission is to identify what's authentic and what's inauthentic when it comes to Jesus' teachings. So any teachings that had to do with the early church and, and, and the Messianic uh, Christ figure and all of those things are tossed out at the very beginning, and you're back into pulling out, uh, trying to identify what's authentic what came from the historical person and, and what came from the author of the gospel itself. And where did he get his information? How did he change it? Um, how did he redact it? How did he, you know, put in his own opinion spots and, and verbiage to, you know, slant it in a certain way? Because the earliest gospel, um, Mark, was not written until around 70 CE, so that's 40 years after the time that Jesus died. And, um, by that time, Christianity was up and running, but it was something totally different than what Jesus had taught. So, but scholarship-wise, you have to always make your evaluations on what um, what's authentic to Jesus and what isn't. Now, I would agree with much of what scholars say, and not agree about a, a variety of the sayings, which I think they toss out from consideration, but they shouldn't be. So, um, but that's the first step. Rather than just trying to look at everything that's in the Gospels, every everything that it says that they put into the mouth of Jesus, and then trying to go, you know, work with that, that's going to be a waste of time for people because they really have to start working with what the authentic words of Jesus were, and it gets to places where it gets debatable in various cases. But at least you're then in the realm of what's potentially historical, rather than what's mythological and what the teachings were, you know, that were put into his mouth by the, the authors of the Gospels themselves, which was, a, you know, something that everybody did in those days. Uh, mythology, you know, was just uh, taken for granted that that if you read a story like that, it's going to have, uh, you know, miracles and this and that and so forth. And, um, but people didn't necessarily view those things as being historical facts uh, but, you know, religious, spiritual truths, you know, a message that's coming through with teachings that's attributed to somebody that they didn't actually say. Then I say, well, you know, if he could have, 
Jesus, Jesus would have said this. I'm sure he would, but that was just the opinion of the the gospel author. So if you take every one of each one of the the, the four canonical gospels, you're going to get a slightly different Jesus. And then when you get into the gospel like the Gospel of Thomas, you get a much different Jesus. Oh yeah, I've read the Gospel of Thomas, and that was that one. If you ask me, in my opinion, had a lot of mystical teaching in it. But uh, then too, I'm not a scholar, but it appeared like that to my uh, uneducated reading. I'll put it to you that way. Yeah. Well, I'd say there's about twenty percent of the Gospel of Thomas that can be arguably attributed to the historical Jesus, which is our sayings that we didn't have before, or their variations on things that are in the Gospels, but their earlier versions of it. And that's patched together with with the Christian Gnostic um, mythology that is very um, uh, mystical in places like you say. Uh, for instance, I think it's... Uh, will be on 77, might be 70, I can't remember, but where the words they put into Jesus' mouth is, uh, lift the rock and you will find me, cleave the wood and you will find me there, which is to say that God's everywhere, and they can, you know, reinforce the whole uh, kingdom of God is within your concept. And scholars, for the most part, stay away from that, because um, the only place in the four Gospels where Jesus says the kingdom of God is within you is in the Gospel of Luke. And the word for within there is entos, but entos in Greek, but that word can also be translated as among. So scholars today always translate it as the kingdom of God is among you. And they stay away from this kingdom is within you bit because they don't get it far as mysticism is concerned. Um, you know, they haven't really given any thought to what if Jesus at some point had had some kind of incredible mystical experience and and based all of his teachings and everything he did from then on on that mystical experience. They just don't go there because they don't have this connection to the East. They're not even thinking in that direction. They don't know what a mystic is for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, you know, Western, just, Western philosophy is, um, if you ask me, a lot more exoteric, whereas uh, Eastern philosophy is a lot more esoteric. And uh, I don't know if that's just my observation or if you would share it. <laughs> well... You'd have to go, you know, looking closely in the Gospels to find what you think is is comparable to what was saying in the in the East. But yeah, exoteric certainly in Eastern philosophy because they can say what they want to say and not have to couch it in other language because you know India is a mystically based you know country. You know, and, and Vedanta or Hinduism is has been around for a very long time and. And it's always, you know, promoted that way of looking at reality. So the question comes down to, for me, um, was Jesus saying the same thing or not? and Or generally the same thing. And if I can show that he was, then you come up with that scenario. And, and unless I can do that, or somebody can do that, then um, it's something else again. But, you know, all, all scholars aren't exactly the same, and, and one scholar... Probably some of your audience knows of his works, but uh, Marcus Ford, um, who is professor of religion at uh, Oregon State University, and a member of the Jesus Seminar, and uh, he basically has promoted the idea that Jesus was a holy man, and which is something that, that the rest of the Jesus Seminar doesn't want to look at. And they're still stuck on this Jesus was a cynic sage deal, when in fact, you know, just the teachings are so far beyond that that they, they just don't get it. So they they often, uh, you know, get on board's case for uh, for being more mystically oriented, more spiritually oriented, when these guys are not particularly interested in anything spiritual. They just, you know, it's their job to dissect the, the Gospels and the rest of the Bible and, you know, the, do well, all that. I think I'm kind of in a landmine here, and I might be getting myself in trouble. 
but it sounds to me an awful lot like from listening to you, like um, the guys at the Jesus, Jesus Seminar have the same trouble agreeing on different points of this here topic that the uh, actual scholars have uh, agreeing on. It's like uh, maybe it's really a very complex uh, subject then, isn't it? Yeah, it's a very complex subject, and depending on who's studying it and who's discovered this, that, or the other, and whether other scholars agree with him, it can make huge differences. But I was reading this one um, piece of literature from a past period of the Jesus Seminar um, in working on my next book, and and in this particular case, they had met in two different uh, locations at two different times, and each time there was a different group of scholars that voted on the sayings that they were considering. And they were had to do with the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God and, and which of those were authentic in the Gospel of Mark. So the first group that got together did their vote and they came out with this. And then, you know, a few years later they met at Notre Dame and went over the same material, but the makeup of the group was different. And so they came up with something different. But where it was important to decide uh, is that they've put together this database of what they consider to be authentic sayings of Jesus, and they've thrown the rest of it out of the database, which means any time they consider anything in the future, they're, they're leaving out part of the potential evidence. And that's sort of like, you know, the frustration it is with the legal courts and when the, when the judge says, well, you can't bring that into evidence, even though it might <laughs> solve the problem here, but, you know, it was gathered the wrong way, and therefore, you know, we can't present it. So, you know, it's a screwy kind of thing, And but the, the one good thing about the scholarship is the same as science in general. They keep at it, and um, they keep coming up with new method, methods of examination and new ways of looking at things, and that's all very helpful. So, you know, I wouldn't want to get rid of any of that, Um and, you know, it doesn't matter with me, I guess, what, what their religion is, but I, I think that we do have to, to re-examine the, what, what the historical sayings of Jesus are from a perspective of spiritual Jesus as opposed to this kind of crazy notion that all he was was a cynic sage. Uh, so anyway. <laughs> well, from my personal intake, I really thought he was a lot more than a, uh, a cynic sage. Uh, but I wouldn't consider him necessarily any more a god than anybody else either, other than the fact that perhaps he might have had uh, some what they call anointing of some kind that uh, others might would consider enlightenment or, you know, much like the Buddha, Gandhi, and, you know, others. But would those other men be god uh, men as well as the church would have you think is uh, another point of contention, wouldn't you say? Well, yeah, because in the in the earliest writings that we have on the historical Jesus that come from uh, come from uh, the gospel that they call Q, uh, which is a, a saying source that was used by Matthew and Luke, um, and the, the sayings in the Gospel of Thomas show quite clearly that the earliest followers of Jesus didn't see him as uh, the Messiah, and they didn't see him as God. And in fact, it wasn't even important to him as them necessarily. that They gave no religious meaning to his crucifixion, and, and uh, you know, the earliest teachings don't have anything about a resurrection in there either. So all that came later, and Jesus' actual followers, the earliest followers, didn't see him as, you know, a God in any sense of the term. Right. And also, they, if, from what I've gathered from my research into this, is that they were really more interested in his teaching. It was uh, more like he was enlightened and bringing them the way he was a rabbi, you know, not necessarily a, a prophet or a God or anything like that, so much as a rabbi. <clears throat> they were more interested in what he taught than all the other dressings were added to him later. Would you... You know, think I'm far off on that? No, that's exactly what it shows, because the earliest collection <clears throat> of teachings were just the teachings. There wasn't any storyline, 
And if they had thought of him as the Messiah or as Son of God, that would have been inherent in those teachings, and it's not there. So the earliest teachings that we know about just don't have any of that stuff in it. Don't so, have the virgin birth in it or any yeah, of that? None of that. Now, as I was giving to understand it, there had been other stories of other virgin births. I, I don't know if you've run across them or not. You're in a position that you very well might have, uh, like Horus and Mithra, Zoroaster, what have you, were supposedly of a virgin birth. They had their own disciples. Uh, they went around healing, and they shared some of the many um, attributes of Jesus, is my understanding, if this is accurate. And then people, therefore, think that this is a... Um, a metaphorical story passed down through the centuries applied to different men and that it got applied to Jesus in the later church. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, you know, the, the people had certain traditions of, of mythology and they got used over and over again with different people. And that was the case with Jesus. So there's the Jesus of history and then there's the Christ of faith. So they started seeing Jesus in terms of something beyond what he ever said he was, and therefore created a whole mythology of him as a god. And yes, you would find it in other uh, religions and uh, in various cult groups during that period of time. So you know, numerous teachers were were considered you know born. Robert, your voice kind of dropped off. I don't mean to interrupt you, but. It- you may not be aware. It sounds like you moved away from your uh, mouthpiece or whatever, but you kind of, I don't know if you lost a connection or what, but you're kind of hard to hear. Oh, well, I haven't that's, changed that's anything. Maybe I, I kind of just talk louder, I guess. But, yeah, Mithras and, and numerous other cults like that, they all had the same types of mythology. You know, the, you know, even the death and resurrection concept all came from that as well. So, you know, the, the early gospel writers were were just you know using the, the 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 mythology of the day to apply to Jesus and it might have made sense from that angle back then but today's Christians you know look at it and they they believe it as actual history rather than mythology and that's where you know every, everything gets turned around and, and people you know don't understand really what was going on back then yeah and if you ask me, from what I've been able to tell, it seems like the actual turning point in the thought process was the actual mother church, the Catholic church, right when she veered off and took over, the Western thought seemed to quit matching the Eastern thought at, at that point in time. Um, do you think I'm very far off in what what that seems like to me? No, there, there was a, a dividing point, but you know, it didn't quite happen like the thing is that there are numerous different Christian groups back in the early days. <clears throat> there was no consensus. But what the Roman Catholic Church came out of was essentially the teachings of, of Paul and his authentic letters, because you've got maybe half of all of Christian doctrines are included in the letters of, of Paul. And that's just the direction that former Christianity took and other forms of Christianity you don't hear about, you know, they're not on the same equal par, only because those texts haven't been um, saved the way that the four canonical Gospels were saved, and they were saved by the Roman Catholic Church. So, you know, these are the documents they say, you know, are canonical and should be you know, worked with, and every other Gospel that was written, um, we're not going to talk to you about it because it's all crap. So... <laughs> You know, it's, uh, you know, there, there's been a lot of work in the past couple of decades looking at other Gospels, uh, even if they're fragmentary, um, or, you know, the Gnostic Gospels that were discovered back in 1945, and, you know, saying, okay, all of this represents um, a Christianity that was in itself a legitimate form, It was just a different form than the Apostle Paul's form and the early church. So once once that Paul's 
side of things got developed, it just went in in one particular direction, and uh, all the others went in other directions. And we would probably, well, I mean, we have different, we have that today, when you think about it. If you have Roman Catholicism and Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, all kinds of Protestant denominations, Mormonism, etc., you know, yeah. even today, we have a hundred different versions of Christianity. So it shouldn't be... Uh, I'd say at least, if not more. <laughs> yeah. So that's the way it was back then, too. And nobody in the early days had to say, well, ours is right and yours is wrong. And because yours is wrong, we're going to have to, you know, burden it to state. Um, so that, you know, the doctrinaire stuff came later. And, you know, there wasn't so much prejudice in the very early days. People just thought about Jesus in different ways. And that was okay. Yeah, it was okay, at least. Anyway, I wanted to make sure we had time to guide this here conversation into the other book that you were mentioning earlier. Um, let me scroll down to this one here. It's on your website. Uh, Jesus, Buddha, Krishna, Leia, Tazu, uh, the parallel sayings. And some of that I may have pronounced wrong. I'm not real good with certain words that are like spelled T-Z-U or L-A-O, I think it's L-A-O, but sometimes I know they have different sounds, so correct me if I'm wrong on that, any of that. But the main thing uh, about the title here is, is the t- not the names I might be wrong about, but the fact that these all have parallel sayings. And, um, you know, it's amazing that we were talking about, you know, the real secrets of Christianity and the, uh, you know, how nobody had a consensus and agreed on anything, but yet there's these same parallel sayings, so... Why don't we move into that real quick? All right. Yeah, and the, the fourth uh, name you mentioned was Lao Tzu. And uh, <clears throat> of those four, you know, featured as four different men, in fact, only Jesus and the Buddha were historical figures where um, Krishna and Lao Tzu are, are basically mythological. But... You know, that's not the important part. The important part is the teachings, you know, and do do they have anything in common? So, you know, I I believe that they did and was able to, I think, establish that in many ways. But in in a lot of cases, I would use uh, sayings that were taken from the Gnostic Gospels as opposed to the canonical Gospels. And the average Christian would look at that and go, wait a minute, you can't do that. (laughs) Those are not right. Those are not authentic. But, you know then they would have to technically prove that they were authentic, you know, which they couldn't do. Um, but the point is, you know, here are all these things that are attributed to Jesus, just as things were attributed to the Buddha that, you know, didn't come out of his mouth, but they're Buddhist teachings um, that parallel Jesus' teachings, either in the Canonicals or in the Gnostic Gospels. So, you know, the idea of paralleling all four of those um, traditions was to show that you know, we have more in common than we think um, with these other systems of thought, and to hopefully you know make some sense out of you know how how Jesus fits into that whole scheme of things. So, do you think that perhaps once you extrapolate all the things that they uh, all these classical teachers did agree on, that would be a good starting point for it? Uh, a doctrine uh, or a fresh doctrine that, you know, could be clear of some of the extra rubbish on the, the other stuff that ain't agreed upon? Well, uh, one thing that I'm going to do um, soon is to write a new version of the Gospel, go back to the original Greek and translate it directly from there, and pull out everything that I'm convinced you know, is consistent with every other saying and, you know, discuss what of those I think are historical and what I think uh, come from other sources that are still attributed to Jesus and then have a new new manuscript to work with, if you will, a new gospel to work with that would then be able to parallel everything else in a more um, logical manner. So it's, my task would be to go in there and, and and take out the stuff that had nothing to do with the spiritual Jesus and concentrate on Jesus as, as a spiritual teacher and and go 
at the whole problem that way. So we'll see what happens with that. But, you know, that would be the database for me, um, would be this, this every gospel that is just a compilation of parts of, you know, other gospels. Sounds like you got your work cut out for you on that one. That, I mean, to pull up all these teachings like that and get them documented and translated, that's a time-consuming project. You might be doing that for a couple of years or more, you think. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and I'm, I'm going to be starting real soon a, a whole chaplain uh, program at, in a uh, hospital at Seattle, so I don't know how much time I'll have to do with that, but, you know, it's one of those things that you use as a hobby, so <laughs> whatever, you know, few minutes I get here and there, I, I try to work on that. So, yeah, it, it, it'll take a while. Yeah, I would imagine it would. And I mean, then, too, from what my understanding is, <clears throat> we got very, very, very little written uh, scripture that was actually written in the uh, days that Jesus actually lived. I, I read online the other day that they recently found an ancient manuscript of Mark that had been written in the days of Jesus, but I have not yet had time to confirm if they uh, found out it was this really a uh, you know, legitimate scripture or one of the forgeries they talk about so much. But I did hear that was out. But to my knowledge, that's the only one that they've even found. Uh, so you couldn't really get anything back to the original days, could you? Well, you're probably referring to the secret gospel of Mark, um, which is a whole a whole big subject in itself. Um, but as far as, you know, what, what one would consider historical... You can only look at certain documents because they're the only ones that are going to give you that um, potential for historicity. And a lot of the, the Gospels that were written by traditional Christians after that period, early period of time um, were fanciful to the extreme. You know, they have all kinds of crazy stories in them because Christians back then, you know, they wanted to know more about Jesus, just like the, the super, Superman of the time the hero figure, and, you know, tell us more, tell us more. So authors just made this stuff up, um, just one thing after another, because people were eating it up. So, you know, when you look at the, all the early material through the first four centuries, you have to kind of put aside all this other stuff that really is, you know from, from the get-go that it's not historical, and just deal with the stuff that has the potential to be historical. Kind of like yeah. selling their manuscripts to the superstitious public to make a buck in their day. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was for them exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then you yeah, have we, to go back and ask yourself how much of that's in the Bible today that's considered infallible fact. Yeah, and there's all kinds of fanciful stuff in in the four canonical gospels, and you have to separate that stuff out if you ever are going to have a, uh, an idea about what the historical Jesus actually taught. And that is the work of scholars. And they've been doing it now for almost 200 years. Unfortunately, um, you know, the Christians out there, they don't know about it. They either don't know about this or is so they're so threatened by it that they'll do anything in their power to discredit it. And, you know, if a person's faith is strong enough, you would think that they would... Uh, be able to uh, say, okay, I'm going to look at something that I don't believe in, but, you know, give it a fair analysis, and if it changes any of my philosophy, fine, but, of course, I, you know, I know Christianity is perfectly true, and so it won't affect me in any way. It's like, what if they did study, you know, other points of view? And, um, and if you do, if you study enough other points of view, you realize that, you know, you don't know anything. And, and um, the more you think you know, the more you don't know. And you just realize that you you have to walk into the unknown if you ever want to to know the truth. And so you give up, you know, and all the Eastern philosophies teach this, you give up all, all conceptions about what's true and what isn't because it doesn't help anything. And if your mind isn't open, you're never going to grow. Now that and is true. So, and unfortunately, most Christians are, are like that to one degree or another. You know, I think a lot of them, though, they get in there and they uh, they accept what's said from the pulpit with little or no um, verification steps made on their part. 
and then if they do start seeing something questionable and they do suspect it, they're afraid to touch it because now they become gullible, naive, and uh, superstitious, and that's kind of quite a whack to your intelligence and your ego to have to listen to it. And it's more tempting to try to just defend your stand than to admit you went there in the first place. Yeah. Well, you know, too many people want surety in life. They want to be told what's true and then stick to it. They don't tell me anything else because it rocked the boat. And, you know, looking back at my seminary days, you know, it was a, it was a horrible kind of revelation to come upon me at that point in my life because I was a typical believing Christian that, you know, basically believed that the, the Gospels were history. And so did all my classmates. And all of a sudden, to find out that's not true, I mean, we went through, you know, the first two years was just agonizing because, you know, we would get together in the dorm and talk to 3 o'clock in the morning about, you know, how can this be, and so forth and so on. So, you know, we protested. We went through Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five stages of dying, in a sense, because at first we were in denial and then anger and so forth. Um, so it took us time to get through the process. So I feel a great deal of compassion for Christians that aren't able to do it because it's so threatening to them. You know, they have certain things taken away from them that they believe, uh, that they believed in all their life. You know, they don't want to admit that, that maybe that wasn't true after all. Uh, right. Yeah. Now, before we get out of here, because I've been here 40 minutes, I know I usually go an hour sometimes too, just depends on what's happening. I wanted to make sure we uh, got to this part that uh, you can tell us kind of an idea on this here parallel teachings. Um, what kind of teachings were they, in other words? I mean, what did everybody seem to agree on? Uh, you know, a, a summary. I know you probably don't want to fill a whole book's worth right here and now, but to kind of give people an idea what the general doctrine might have been that, that they all shared. Okay, um, actually I'm going to turn to the table of contents for that book in particular, and it's pretty much the same in Hymns to the Beloved, but the, one, the, the topic headings I have for the chapters are the Great Way, is number one, and that's the path itself. In Buddhism, you'd call it the Dharma. Um, in in um, Taoism, it's the, the Tao, um, which translates as way. And then Jesus, when he talked about um, taking the narrow gate and traveling the you know the path that, that most of humanity does not, and so you're comparing those things with each other as far as you know the, the, the path of life and the, how a person's life is led seeking the truth. Um, my second chapter is titled God, Tao, and the Universal Mind and looks at various conceptions of God, uh, um, but God that is, you know, the sum total of all that exists as opposed to, you know, the, the sky God and, you know, the God that breaks into history and manipulates things and so forth and so on. So the whole mystical, you know, that that concept of God, you know, as being the all in all, the, the, the essence of the whole universe, and the, it, 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 it exists all around us and within us and so forth because we're part of it. <coughs> and then chapter on being one, um, which is, you know, how to unite your consciousness with God so that you have this realization of, you know, you know you're, you're essentially projecting reality um, on yourself, and so you know if you use the techniques and meditation and so forth to to become <clears throat> mystical in that sense, then your understanding of God just gets much much bigger, and it encompasses everything. And another chapter called the Self, which is you know we have our ego selves, but in Hinduism we talk about the Atman. Uh, which is the, the great self, which is identified exactly the same as Brahman or the Godhead. So Atman Brahman goes together, and uh, that's the, you are God in a sense. And so you know, I'm pulling Jesus' statements in there too, um, you know, wherever they fit. Um, and then I've got you know the most of the rest of them have to. Oh, I've got karma and reincarnation, death and immortality. Uh, enlightenment for sure 
um, and then traditional ones that, that are easy, like love and compassion and so forth, and then uh, cutting the ties that bind, which is the path of renunciation, and that's one whole thing that, that Christians of all stripes don't want to deal with. Um, <laughs> when Jesus tells them to do things or suggests that they ought to li- live life this way, and they go, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm not ready to do that. And, you know, the, everybody has the, their blind spots, and when they read something like the Gospels, uh, uh, they're, they're going to see what they want to see. So, you know, it's, our spiritual evolution is just that. We keep evolving and evolving, you know, hopefully um, people are evolving. And even those that are in denial, uh, I think, will come along in the in the long run. Um, so you know, it's, it's just waking. We're waking up gradually and seeing what we didn't see before, and that's really what it comes down to. So I think more and more people are uh, going past their fear and their need to know absolute truths, and just be open to uh, information uh, and wisdom from wherever it comes. So did that, did that help at all as far as your question? Yeah, it helped uh, actually a whole lot. I mean, that's a, you know, pretty much a, the, I've noticed the same thing before, um, you know, that these people would share the, some of these same views and I know that, um, you know, uh, your understanding of God plays a role in this here. I mean, for example, my understanding of God or how the whole situation works comes very similar to something you said earlier. I've often, uh, you know, viewed it as though what we are is an extension of God. In other words, uh, he's living through us in this reality rather than just floating in space with nothing to do, in other words. Yeah, and it really comes down to uh, the two sides, two great world views between East and West, and... Western religions are dualistic. They're, you know, there's you and there's creation and there's the creator. Two different realities that can never mix, can never come together. And Eastern philosophy, uh, there's monism, which means that everything is part of God. And so those, those two great, you know, ways of looking at reality are, are hugely different and, and it changes how you relate to the world if you think, you know, God is out there. And that, you know, I pray to him and I hope he's going to do this. And, and if he, if this doesn't happen, um, you know, why not? Uh, you know, how could they take this child that was only three? How could God do that? Or, you know, how could, how could there be a God if they have the Holocaust and World War II? That was my father's thing. You know, he stopped believing in God because of the Holocaust. Because, you know, what kind of compassionate God would allow something like that to happen? But if you see it, if you see reality is all the same, all one thing, then you have to start looking at things in a totally different way, and um, you know, and ultimately the truth is within us, uh, each and every one of us, all the time, and that's the place that the masters all tell us to go to find it within. Right, and you know, one of the things you're talking about, how does God allow something like the Holocaust and and all honesty, from what I was given to understand, even in the days of ancient Egypt, uh, one of the prime teaching was that in all of creation, you have polarity. You've got the, um, you know, light and the dark, the good and the evil. Uh, without both, you have you can't contrast one to the other. You don't know what warm water is until you blend the hot and the cold, for example. So, therefore, yeah. in order to enjoy life. You would have to also suffer the Holocaust in, or you're missing half your reality, in other words. Right, exactly. And there's a, a, a saying in the, the Gospel Dialogue of the Savior um, attributed to Jesus, and he says, You cannot see the light unless you stand in the darkness. And I like that, but I think the clearest symbolism for what you're talking about there is the yin-yang, which is the two sides of the Tao, and you see the black side and the and the white side, and you see the small white circle within the black half and the small black circle within the white half. But if you look at that symbol and you could make it um, move graphically so that those small uh, colors 
opposite colors in each side started to expand and expand and expand on each half until the black side becomes all white, and the, the white side becomes all black, and then new circles appear of the opposite in each side. And, and it's just a, a, a way of symbolizing the fact that there is one reality and um, there, well, you know, it's, it's, um, it's uh, the force, you know? You've got the dark side of the force, you've got the good side of the force, and that's all reality. And so you would have to say, you would have to allow for in your philosophy that what we call evil is also included in what we think of as God, not a separate force that's resisting this entity, which we call God, but, you know... It's all of part the of the whole. And it's, we're the ones that judge things as, as evil or good. Um, nature doesn't do that. Nature only is, is interested in balance. Uh, so when things are out of balance, things happen to, to return to balance. But, you know, they're, <laughs> a dog or a cat it. doesn't know anything about good and evil. Those are our conceptions based on, you know, how we view life. And anything that we like that's pleasant for us is considered good, and anything we don't like is considered evil. Right. Now, and I can see where, you know, how... You know, it gets that way. I mean, especially after a one-way, uh, you know, brand of teaching down through the millennia. Um, you were saying something a minute ago that reminded me of a passage in the Bible. I want to say it was Isaiah. It was somewhere in the Old Testament where um, the prophet was uh, being, you know, influenced by God or the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of the Lord. And he says, Yea, I, Yahweh create the good and the evil, I do all these things, um, you know, would be kind of, I think, going along with what you were just saying. In other words, wouldn't you think so? Well, absolutely, and that's the way um, the Hebrew faith was at that time. It was, it, it allowed for everything being within God in terms of good and evil. And um, what happened was, why that changed is that the 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 Hebrews that had settled in the area of Palestine when they were conquered by the Babylonians, they were the southern kingdom of Judah was hauled off in the lock, stock, and barrel to Babylon, where they, you know, were were slaves for the next fifty or so years until they were freed by Cyrus um, the Persian when the Persians captured Babylon, and which let them. Uh, return to their homeland, but what they got from the Persians in the meantime was this religion of Zoroaster, Zoroastrianism, and Zoroaster had come up with the idea that if God is God, then there can't be any evil within him. Therefore, there must be an opposing force in the universe uh, that works against God. So when those Jews came back to their homeland, um, most of the people still in that homeland that hadn't been taken away believed uh, the, the, the old way, and and those who returned eventually convinced all of Judaism that there was a dualism, and that there there must be this uh, character called Satan. When in fact, if you look at the passages having to do with Satan in the Old Testament, never is he shown or featured as an evil creature, but somebody who is God's um, accuser or or um, trier, tester of people's souls. And so he worked hand-in-hand -hand with, with the Lord and, um, and was not a force opposing God at all. So these are the, you know, the, as religion involves, all these funny things happen. And, you know, what, what, people once believed starts to change um, until, you know, everybody starts believing it. Now all of a sudden you have a, a new dogma, a new doctrine, a new, you know, authenticity, and everybody doesn't believe that is a heretic. And then the next thing you know, you got all these different doctrines, and you got to ask yourself, which one's the right one? Which one should I tr put my trust in? Because they don't all match. Right. Well, my recommendation on that score would be to read widely, to study both Eastern and Western philosophy and theology, and um, come to your own conclusions. And that nobody should, you know, Buddha says this quite clearly, just 
don't believe anything is written in books or anything that anybody tells you simply because of that. But, you know, find out how it, it, it's tested out in your own self. Does it feel like this is the truth or does it feel you're not so sure? Um, and that's the final arbiter is our, ourselves. And, but it takes having an open mind and the, the, the willingness to to say that you could be wrong and you might be able to learn more things if you would just shut up and, and, and read and look and listen um, and just be open to things and not worry so much about, you know, you have to have the truth or else, you know, you know you, you're not who you're supposed to be. But, you know, I think a true seeker is somebody that is willing to walk into the unknown without anything at all and say, okay, you know. Well, you know, if t- Jesus is teaching was to take the narrow path, the path that uh, few people went. Well, if you look at Christianity today, it's one of the biggest followings in the world. Maybe that's a clue that rather than following a path laid out by man, you should do what few people do and follow your own path and walk in uh, communion with God instead. Yeah, exactly, and that's why if somebody said, asked me, well, what's your religion or your spiritual philosophy, I would have to kind of equivocate in a sense because it's so all-inclusive, all most people wouldn't understand it. So I could say, well, you know, I'm part Hindu, part Buddhist, part Taoist, um, <laughs> all the, the teachings of the historical Jesus, and you put all that together, and that's, that's who I am. Um, but, you know, no matter where I am, I still have to completely keep an open mind on everything. And, you know, I read and I listen and, you know, et cetera. But, you know, I'm not going to shut down any part of my mind against, you know, something that might be more truth than I have now. And that's what, you know, people that want truth should do is simply always be open. Be open to it. Right. And I do agree with that. Um, Real quick, like, since we're getting close to the end here, you got a moment to say, uh, tell us of any upcoming events or anything you would like people to know about that maybe I haven't mentioned yet or brought out in any kind of way, shape, or form? Mm, gosh, I, I, I don't know. I, I can't think of what that might be. <laughs> okay. Well, you got any last-minute thoughts for everybody? Um, once again, I would just say, you know, Go ahead and listen to people and read and all that, but trust your own heart. Because in the final analysis, that's all you have. That's where God resides, and that's where truth is. So just keep an open mind and an open heart. And that's exactly what I tell my kids and everybody I know. Only I word it a little different. I say in order to be true to God, you must first be true to yourself or you can't be good true to God or anybody else. It has to start with you and then work its way outward. Exactly. And that's why I say yeah. you, you should never try to, you know, cohere somebody in it, you know, Christianity, Buddhism, Gnosis. No, because once they're going your way, they're not being true to themselves. They're being true to you. Right. right. Exactly. And just, you know, never assume that you have all the truth, because you don't. And just assume that there's more to learn, and you will learn more. Yeah, it's been one of my experiences. Just as soon as you think you know something to be a fact, you come to learn that it never was a fact. It only seemed like a fact. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Life is funny like that. (laughs) (laughs) It sure is. (laughs) Okay, well, listen... uh, I've really enjoyed having you, and I'd love to have you back again. In fact, I'd carry this con- uh, conversation further if, well, to be honest with you, I've been having some back troubles today, and I've been not wanting to sit up here any longer than what I had to and go. Re- I need to go relax my back. But would you consider coming back in the future and talking to us? Oh, sure. All righty. Yeah, well, you can tell. Huh? You can tell I like to talk. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. I have no problem with that. I, I kind of like to do it myself. But, uh, yeah, I've got your information. I'll stay in touch with you, and I look forward to having you back in the future. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me on your show. And I want to thank everybody that joined in and listened to the show and, you know, being a partaker in it. I mean, if you don't do nothing but listen, you're partaking, and I couldn't have a show without listeners. 
And folks, also one last detail real quick. If I can bring this here up, I want to remind everybody to come back this Tuesday and we'll be talking to Edward Van Hoos, I believe it is, if I can get that in front of me, about reincarnation in the Bible, which I think is going to be a pretty, yeah, Captain Larry Edward Van Hoos and the, the, how the Bible reveals reincarnation. So I invite everybody to join us for that Tuesday night at 8 p.m. And don't forget to check out my friends at uh, United Ning International. Um, uh, I got the link to it on the left, but it's United Paranormal International. Great folks with a uh, social network over there. And I always try to get at least one plug into them since they give me plugs all the time. And I'm going to say good night to Larry and all you people out in listeners land. And we'll be back Tuesday night. Thank you very much. Y'all have a good one. And... Uh,